everybody, let's talk about Logos. If you've been watching these videos, you already know that Logos is the rhetorical appeal that focuses on the reasonability of the message rather than the author's self-presentation or the audience's feelings. Logos relies on the reasoning capabilities of the author and the audience to bring them into agreement. When we talk about Logos in the modern period, we generally focus on the author's ability to provide evidence. Things like science or statistics or academic research. Don't get me wrong, those are all really, really great things and you will use them in your own arguments. But in the ancient Greek world, people didn't employ a good logos just through doing good research. They also employed good logos through logic. As a modern society, we're great with facts and figures, but less great at actually walking through our reasoning. So if we're going to talk about logos, we need to talk about logic. And when we talk about logic, we need to talk about how to reason through problems. So we're gonna need an analogy, something that lets us talk about sets and pieces. So in order to talk about logic, let's talk about Lego. And to get us started, let's walk through the basics of the two most common types, which are called deductive and inductive logic. Let's say that you're walking around barefoot on the floor and you step on a Lego. And you say, ouch! But then you also ask, hey, what's this from? What can I figure out about this Lego piece? So you gather together all your sets and figure out which ones contain gray Legos, and you figure out it has to be from one of your Star Wars sets. Then you look at all the Star Wars sets and determine which ones also contain little red and black strut pieces. When you look at those sets, the only one that has those red and black strut pieces is your Imperial Assault Carrier. And when you flip it over, you find out it's missing one of its retractable feet. So yay, you fixed your broken Lego set, but you've also performed deduction. Deduction is a top-down reasoning process where you start from large general sets of ideas called premises to formulate a conclusion about something specific. In this case, looking at your large completed Lego sets lets you to determine a lot about the individual piece and where it belongs. But logic can go the other direction too. Let's say you dump out a paper sack that's full of Lego parts. What are these supposed to make? You see some wheels, some long chassis pieces, parts for a scoop shovel, and you make a solid guess based on all those parts. When you do that, your best guess is that the parts were meant for a front-end loader or maybe a digger. You can't be 100% sure, but you can definitely build most of one from the pieces. And the more pieces that fit, the better you feel about your guess. So congrats, you've just performed induction. This is a bottom-up reasoning process that uses your imagination to combine lots of smaller, specific pieces of information to make a large generalization. Both kinds of logic have their pros and cons. With deduction, working down from big universals to smaller truths means that you can make an airtight case. As long as your logic is both valid and true, you can't refute deductive logic. The downside is that you can't create new information because you have to start with what's already known. You get total certainty, but inside a limited set of what you already know. That makes its usefulness more limited to certain kinds of inquiry. When you work from specific observations to create big ideas using induction, you can discover a whole universe of big ideas out there. You can't do that with deduction. Induction is expansive, but it also has a trade-off. Whereas deduction gives you an airtight reasoning, induction only gives you probability. That's because you have to use your imagination to put the pieces together. When you think about logic, how you use logic is going to depend a lot on the kinds of information you use. If you start from top to bottom, you're going to use deduction, and you're probably gonna be able to come up with a logically certain conclusion, but you also have to be careful because it can be valid, but not necessarily true. If you're starting with lots of small pieces of information moving from bottom to top, you've got induction, which means you can create new knowledge, but you have to remember that it's going to be probable rather than certain, and it requires an intuitive leap of your imagination. Let's start off with a review of the basics of deduction. It works kind of like math, and if you understand set theory, this will make 100% sense. 
For a deductive argument to work, it needs three parts, a large and a smaller assumption, known as premises, and a logical conclusion that's based on those two. Let's start by shoehorning my dog into this video. So let's start with the premise, all dogs are lazy. Secondly, Sophie is a dog. Finally, we conclude that Sophie is lazy. Those symbols that you see mean that dogs belong to the set called lazy. Sophie belongs to the set called dogs. Therefore, Sophie also belongs to the set that's called lazy. For the rest of us who aren't math enthusiasts, let's think about this as a set of overlapping circles. Our larger judgy set is things that are lazy, and it completely contains the set of dogs. That's what makes our major premise. The smallest set, Sophie, is completely contained in the set of dogs. That's the minor premise. Since all dogs are located in the major premise, and Sophie is 100% dog, we can conclude that she is a lazy, sleepy old pupper. These sets can be used to make negative deductions too, but that requires a slightly different set organization. If you're proving that something isn't in a set, two of the sets have to be completely unrelated, but related to each other. But in order for positive deduction arguments to hold, you have to have total overlap. You can't have categories that are completely unrelated, or don't have anything to do with the premise and the conclusion, or just maybe instances that only apply some of the time. A positive premise is only valid when the big set entirely contains the set of a smaller directly related set, which openly contains the set of the conclusion. So as far as our parts are concerned, this is a valid point, but is it true? I don't know. Let's take a look at this puppy. In this case, one of our premises isn't true, that all dogs are lazy. So that means that the whole deduction isn't true either, but it is performed right. That means it's valid. When you evaluate the logic of a deduction, then you also have to decide, are all these assumptions also true and are they all directly connected? The good news is that you can evaluate pretty much all deductive logic by asking yourself one question. What has to be true in order for this deduction to be right? You can expand that out a little though. For instance, how many steps does it take? And are all of those steps connected and reasonable? In the case of this argument, it had to be true that all dogs are lazy. Since we know that's not true, we can't believe that my dog is lazy just by virtue of being a dog. For instance, let's start with the phrase, if you don't eat beef, you're a vegetarian. In order for this to be true, assuming that the term vegetarian hasn't changed its meaning, then the only creature that's meat is a cow, meaning that other animals like chickens mustn't be meat either. Okay, how about this one? Your friend doesn't want to wash their car before the big baseball game in case the game gets rained out. What has to be true here? It would have to be true that car washing and weather patterns are directly related, which would be a pretty awesome superpower to have, but I doubt that Jiffy Wash has it. Okay, this last one's a little trickier. What has to be true here? In this case, the premise and the proof say basically the same thing. If you tried to draw this out into circles, they'd contain each other and that's impossible. What has to be true here is that logic as we know it doesn't work. This is called circular reasoning. So when you ask that question, what has to be true, you also have to realize that when it's used in the wild, most people aren't going to spell out all their premises for you. When one of the terms gets left out, the term for that is an enthymeme. You can think of it as bumper sticker logic. When you're evaluating a deductive argument and you ask yourself what has to be true, you may have to fill in some blanks to be able to figure that out. So if you look at this bumper sticker, no one is free when others are oppressed, we have to break it down. The first assumption is that freedom only exists as a set that contains all people. Secondly, we know our current state contains people who are oppressed. Since we also know that people who are oppressed cannot be free, then in the current situation, nobody is free. Okay, so there's a very quick and dirty explanation about how deduction works. When you're in dialogue with somebody else, ask those questions. What has to be true in order for this to be right? What are all of the steps in the question and are they all reasonable? 
Okay, that does it for today. We'll talk about two other types of reasoning in the next video. I'll see you then.